You are watching DHTV from California State University to Megas Hills. Hi, I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, and welcome back to NCR 507, which is our course in research design and interpretation. Now today we're going to talk about two main areas. We're going to continue to lay the foundation for measuring, and we're also going to discuss Gerbner's famous cultivation research that talks about violence and the perceptions of violence. And then we'll put it all together to talk about how these key terms operated in some of Ger Gerbner's studies. Now to begin, we're going to start talking about some key terms in measurement. And we're going to start with two terms that I want to differentiate. One is conceptualization, and the other is um, operationalization. Now, as we think about these two ideas, they're actually very simple. And the example I want to give you is the idea of a birdhouse. When we think about building a birdhouse, we have a concept in mind, maybe an image in our heads. We might have an idea that we want to put into practice. But at the conceptualization stage, we know that as a concept, it's just an image. In other words, we haven't figured out any specific plans. Now, as we think about operationalization, this is where we put the plan into operation. And that's an easy way to remember operationalization. Um, what do we mean by that? We mean that these are the specific ways that we get down to actually seeing how that idea is going to operate in research. Now, let's say you were doing a study on fitness and you decided that you wanted to do a study to measure um, fitness levels in individuals. So you might have that concept, the idea that someone would be healthy or fit. But you'd have to decide, after developing the concept, how you wanted it to actually play in your study. So you might choose to use something like this, like a Fitbit, and say, I'm going to call someone fit when they reach a certain number of steps, or sleep a cer certain number of hours, or complete a composite benchmarks. But either way, you can put it into practice or how it will operate in your study in a specific way when you decide how you're going to measure it. Now, when we think about conceptualization and operationalization as researchers, we have to realize that the concept, while it's a great idea, it's really the oper operationalization that matters. So you might decide that you want to measure perceptions. And as you measure perceptions, you might decide to deliver something like a survey and have that be the operationalization of those perceptions that you wish to measure. We'll talk more about that idea in the future. Let's move on to two other important key terms that I want to talk about. Those two are reliability and validity. Now, as a teacher of quantitative methods, I find that these two terms sometimes are used interchangeably. But you and I both know they aren't measuring the same thing or, or indicating the same thing. When we talk about reliability, we're talking about a stable, consistent measurement. And this means that when something is reliable, it is actually stable and constant. When we talk about something being valid, we're saying that it actually measures what we intend to measure. And so that means that when something is valid, it's actually set to measure that thing. So let's think about an example like a watch. Let's say I had a watch or a clock, and I could think about it in terms of reliability. Is it a stable measuring device of time? Does it add minutes or subtract minutes? Is it reliable in its consistency? It's a good clock when it does that. Now you may even have a clock in your home that you know is not reliable, meaning it runs fast or it runs slow. And you know not to rely on that one. So we think about reliability as that stable, constant measurement. Now when we think about validity, we could also think of a clock. And that is that when the, the time is set to the actual time that we're in, then we would say it is actually accurately measuring the hours that we are currently experiencing. What does that mean? Well, think about daylight savings. You could have a reliable clock, but not have it set to the right time. The set to the right time part makes it valid. So as you think about reliability, there are two really different elements, both of which we need in a research study. We need to have stable and consistent measurement, but we also need to have validity in that we are accurately measuring what we intend to measure. So you could think again about the Fitbit example and say, well, I don't know if I consider f the number of steps to be uh, a valid measurement of fitness. And so you might, as a researcher, decide you want to use all sorts of other types of measurement. How much water you drink, um, your weight, your body fat, whatever. You can decide lots of different ways. 
The key when you're thinking about measuring is understanding that you as the researcher control those decisions. And as you make those decisions, you are making them for your study. And however you wish to operationalize is your choice entirely. Now, as we move through this conversation about key elements, we've talked about the operationalization and conceptualization. We've talked about reliability and validity. Um, the next thing to talk about is level of measurement. And so when we talk about level of measurement, we are sometimes also talking about what I call data levels. And that means that when you and I capture data, we do it in four different ways, potentially, from a quantitative method side. There are lots of data out there to collect. But what we're talking about is quantitative measurement. And when I collect the data in the quantitative measurement way, I can capture it one of four ways. So let's take a look at this video that describes measurement levels. As you know, we capture data in a number of ways. One of the most basic principles is the levels of measurement used in data analysis. Let's examine the four levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. The first distinction you notice in this diagram is to differentiate categorical data from continuous data. By this we mean the data are collected in categories or continuous format. Next, we can look at each of these areas and see the specific measurement related to it. Let's start with categorical data collection and examine nominal and ordinal measurement. For nominal measurement, it means that we capture the data in name only. You might think of this as named categories. For example, individuals might identify a personality tendency such as preference for expression. The choices might be extroversion or introversion. When individuals respond with their answers, those answers represent categorical information. In this case, the preference for extroversion or introversion. Another example of nominal level measurement would be to ask individuals to identify their undergraduate major. An individual could review a list of majors to check off their specific degree. In these two examples, the questions provide categorical information about the participant. In this case, nominal data. As you might guess, nominal level data has limitations because it only identifies general information. Because of this, it is also mathematically limited in terms of analysis. Our next measurement level is ordinal. For ordinal measurement, it means that we capture data in categories, but that those categories are also ordered. In other words, order matters. Our example of ordinal measurement could be the level of education. On a survey, the categorical choices might be high school, college, or graduate level education. Here we see categories, but we also note they are in ascending order, meaning that their order reflects more or less of something. In this case, it's education. Another example of ordinal measurement might be indication of socioeconomic status. For example, a person might indicate low, middle, or upper class socioeconomic status. Both of these examples are ordinal in that they are a collection of categorical information, but also have a logical ordering. Both nominal and ordinal measurement levels are considered categorical. This means that the measurement captures categories and the assigned numbers. We note that also for this level of measurement, there can be limited variance as often only a few categories are captured. As we discuss categorical measurement, it is important to acknowledge that construction of these measurement items are subject to two governing rules. The items must be mutually exclusive and the items must be exhaustive. We note that the measurement must be mutually exclusive. This means that the construction of categories must be distinct and not overlap. For example, an individual responding to a survey should only have one answer to mark. Multiple answers should not apply to that individual and if that's the case, the researcher should revise the item because it could yield non-comparable data. Second, we note that measurement must be exhaustive, and this means that there must be enough categories available to capture all of the data. In other words, an individual responding to a survey should have a place to put his or her answer. Having no place to mark an answer also indicates the violation of the standard of exhaustive categories, and also indicates a need for revision of the item.
Now let's explore continuous data measurement levels. We consider continuous data to be superior to categorical data because it captures more variance and has more options for analysis. The first type of continuous data is interval. Interval level data is classified as being in logical order with the presence of equal intervals, but no absolute zero. For example, an institution might be interested in determining academic training. The researchers might decide that SAT scores are the indicator of this training. An individual's SAT scores are considered interval because they are scores with equal intervals, but no absolute zero. Specifically, the scores are equal in their distances because mathematical numbering is equally distant, and also because there is no absolute zero available on the SAT test. The lowest score available on the SAT is 400 and not an absolute zero. So even if an individual missed every item on the SAT test, the lowest score would be 400. Another example is the Amazon star rating system. This is used by individuals to rate products. Scores from multiple raters are added together and average ratings are on particular items on Amazon. Note this also has equal intervals because the distance of a three-star rating to a four-star rating is the same distance as a four-star rating is to a five-star rating. Notice also this measurement does not have an absolute zero as the lowest rating available on Amazon is a one-star rating. Our last level of measurement is ratio measurement. Ratio level data are classified as being in logical order with the presence of equal intervals, but also an absolute zero. Let's suppose an agency might be interested in determining financial need for assistance. The researchers might decide income is an indicator of this financial need. Income is considered ratio because it involves numbers, and those have equal distances, as well as the presence of an absolute zero. Zero income is an available choice. A final example of ratio measurement might be determining work experience. The researchers might decide years of service as an indicator of work experience. Years of service is considered ratio because it involves numbers that have equal distances, as well as the presence of an absolute zero. Zero years of service is a possible choice. In review, we have seen four levels of measurement used in quantitative research methods, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Nominal, categorical measurement in name only, and order doesn't matter. Ordinal, categorical measurement where order does matter. Interval, continuous measurement with equal intervals. And ratio, continuous measurement with equal intervals, and also an absolute zero. As we conclude, an easy way to remember the levels of measurement in their proper order is to think of the wine Pinot Noir. The Noir gives us the acronym to keep the levels of measurement in their proper order and help us remember them. In the end, we know that data collection of certain levels of data yields different information, different levels of variance, and the ability of the researcher to explore more or less options of analysis based on these data. For the second part of our show, we're going to now take the ideas that we first talked about and think about them in terms of Gerbner's famous research on cultivation theory. What Gerbner was thinking as he was developing his cultivation theory and research was this idea that television is America's stor storyteller. In other words, what we see on television gives us a perception of reality, Gerbner would suggest. And so he conducted about 40 years of, of research, about 500 studies. And his main uh, proposition was this notion that people are convinced or, or perceive reality as it is portrayed on television. Now housed in this is a, a broader concept called cultivation. And his suggestion was that the institutions out there are um, processes that underlie the media. And there are prevalent images in the media. And once we see those often enough, then we have this repeated exposure, this idea that the audience beliefs and behaviors reflect that repeated exposure. Now, as we go forward to think about this, let's take a look at the main concepts of Gerbner's cultivation theory.
Let us start our story at the very beginning with story itself. The most distinctive characteristic of human beings as a species is that we are the storytelling animal. For the longest time in human history, stories were told face to face in the community, uh, in the tribe, uh, in the family. And for many uh, hundreds of thousands of years, that was the only thing that is possible. Of course, there was also imagery, monuments like pyramids or obelisks or murals, cathedrals. They're all images and they're designed to create a sense of awe or a sense of understanding of nature or of power. This is the true magic of human life, that the stories by and through which we live are the stories that animate us, that make us seek certain things and fear other things. And for a very long time, this magic was tightly controlled. It was controlled by what we now recognize as the priesthood, as some kind of a priesthood or a tribal chief. Then, at a certain point in history, it all changes. It changes when we reach the Industrial Revolution. When the printing press is combined with the steam engine to make rapid printing possible, uh, to make the spread of literacy a virtual necessity, that presents the Industrial Revolution in storytelling. Where shall I go when I go where I go? From that point on, there are corporations that mass produce stories and create a new kind of entity called the public. This is crucial to understand that it is the mass production of stories and of messages and of images disseminated to millions of people who could never be reached face to face by the same source. And by doing that, they establish a loose aggregation of people who have nothing in common except the publications they share. The second major change a change that is still accelerating is the electronic revolution. And the mainstream of the new electronic revolution is television. After 10 years of experiment, television, first shown to the public at the World's Fair, now takes its place as a new American art and industry. Uh, we have to recognize that television ushers in a new age. Atop a million homes, antennas pluck the pictures from the sky. At a flick of a switch or the turn of a dial, the scene reappears on the television screen. Fantastic. But our children will grow up with this miracle enriching their lives and giving them a new understanding of the whole world. Gosh. For Gerbner, here's what mattered most about all of this. This amazing new storytelling force was conceived from the start as a way to sell things. By television, American business has found a most effective advertising medium. And in turn, advertising has provided the resources that sustain the standards of programming and permit the never-ending research that is the heart of the television industry. The broadcast airwaves may belong to the public, but television in the U.S. was funded from the start almost entirely by advertising. It was private companies, not public tax dollars as in Great Britain and other parts of the world, that bankrolled network TV programs in the U.S. So from the beginning, the primary function of TV shows was to attract large numbers of people to see the advertisements of the businesses that paid for the programs. For the first time in human history, most of the stories, most of the time, to most of the children are told no longer by the parent, no longer by the school, no longer by the church, no longer by the community, no longer handcrafted, no longer community-based, no longer historically inspired, inherited, going from generation to generation, but essentially by a small group of global conglomerates that really have nothing to tell them but have a lot to say. Let's go! From the very beginning, people have no role other than as products who are attracted to a particular program, which in effect is the bait. And 
boys and girls, for the very first time, we all started to eat Wonder Bread at all our meals, breakfast, lunch. Yeah. Those audiences are the audiences who are most likely to be the consumers of a particular kind of product. America's best-selling, best-tasting filter cigarette. It still tastes good like a cigarette should. And then the advertiser, in turn, pays for producing the program. From the very beginning, the public is what is bought and sold. There's one for you, and there's one for you, Joan. It certainly was a fine first round. Well, you know, everybody's buying more and more. Because... Now, out of this comes an inescapable and highly pervasive cultural environment now produced essentially to sell. Brought to you by Coca-Cola. For Gerbner, the commercial nature of this environment was fundamental. Say it. When you call, I want you to say, I'm making a thousand dollar vow of faith. Say the word, thousand dollars. Say it. Operating as businesses first, media corporations present a certain kind of world, a world built to sell, offering up a distinct brand of reality shaped by the demands of the marketplace. Everything else stems from this commercial logic, from the fundamental fact that private corporations decide what fills the public airwaves. Today, a handful of global conglomerates own and control the telling of all the stories in the world. They have global marketing formulas that are imposed on the creative people in Hollywood, and I, I'm in touch with them, and they hate it. They say, don't talk to me about censorship from Washington. I never heard about that. I get censorship every day. I'm told, put in more action, cut out complicated solutions. They apply this formula because it travels well on the global market. These are formulas that need no translation, that are essentially image-driven, that speak action in any language, and of course the leading element of that formula is violence. What Gerbner wanted to understand was this connection between television and the perception of reality. Specifically, he talks about this notion called the mean scary world syndrome. The idea that individuals who consume a lot of television develop a theory um, that the world is full of mean and scary things. Let's take a look. You always have to look over your shoulder. A lot of times you might feel uneasy if somebody's walking by you. You feel like you're always like on guard. To get a handle on what Gerbner means by the mean world syndrome, it's not enough to analyze individual TV programs or films or video games. The entire media context is what matters. How one kind of story or program blends into another to create and reinforce a distinct view and sense of the world. Getting to the heart of the mean world syndrome then requires taking a look at TV the way most of us experience it at home when we're not in classrooms thinking about these things by simply picking up the remote and doing a little channel surfing. When we do, with every change of the channel, we're likely to see the most banal content, alternating with the most bizarre and violent and frightening, so that what would be shocking in our real lives in the media world comes to seem normal and mundane, reinforcing the sense that the world is a place of constant danger and threat. I have to do what I can to protect myself and my children. And that's a fact of life, a way of life. What cultivation analysis has done is to show how these kinds of anxieties and insecurities are caught up explicitly with media culture, uncovering a direct correlation between the amount of television one watches and the level of fear one has of being victimized. If you look at it from a cultivation point of view, you see that the image of victimization, the image of risk, the image of danger, the conception that if there is so much violence in the world, I'm, I'm at risk. Not that I'm going to go down the street to be a mugger, but on the contrary, I'm afraid to go down the street at night. I'm afraid to go into the subways. I'm afraid uh, of strangers. I try to cross the street when I see somebody that I think may be dangerous to me. These are the, the consequences 
of exposure to violence that are cultivated in large communities over long periods of time. The finding that if you watch a lot of TV, you're likely to be more afraid of violence than those who watch less TV may help explain why so many people seem to think violent crime is far worse than it actually is. A widespread misperception that started to be noticed a decade ago when crime rates began to drop. Here is the reality. Violent crime per capita actually dropped slightly in the latest figures released by the Justice Department. Nationwide, murder was down 5%. But the perception continues to dominate reality, triggering a fear that is out of sync with statistics, a fear that no one and no place is safe anymore. And when you're always on guard, it's hard to let go of fear, no matter what the reality. And this classic example of the mean world syndrome continues today. In fact, since that ABC News report about falling crime rates, Justice Department figures show that violent crime has dropped an additional 43% to a remarkable 30-year low. Anderson, the FBI says violent crime dropped 2.5% in 2008. Now that includes an overall 4.4% decline in murders. But, but despite the steady drop, good. polls have consistently shown that most Americans believe just the opposite to be true that crime has actually been increasing. Three quarters of Americans say there is more crime in the United States than there was a year ago. Gallup's annual crime poll shows it's the highest level since the early 1990s. The poll also finds 51% of Americans say there is more crime in their local area than there was a year ago. The logical question is why? Why do fear and anxiety about violence seem to be rising even when the threat of violence is falling? Well, surveys consistently show that upwards of two-thirds of the people who believe crime to be a very serious personal problem say they get most of their news from television. This is the breakthrough of cultivation analysis, a clear correlation between the amount of media we consume and the degree of fear and anxiety we have about the world. So now let's explore this idea. I would like you to review an interview that I conducted previously with Dr. Christina Dermy. And this interview um, is with her. She's a media specialist, and she is an expert in cultivation theory and Gerbner's research. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Christina Dermy, media effects specialist, and I'm here to speak with her about cultivation theory and to talk about the measurement issues related to cultivation theory. Welcome to the show, Christina. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, we wanted to hear your opinion on cultivation theory and kind of I guess the first place to start is to talk about like what is cultivation? What is cultivation? Well the cultivation theory itself is a mass media effects theory which basically argues that um, television as the primary cultural storytelling force of our time cultivates certain ideas and beliefs about the world that we live in. Okay, so beginning there, we have an understanding that television is, is of utmost importance okay. to our society and to our understanding of the world around us, especially when we don't have direct experience or direct contact with certain groups of people, etc. So the theory basically says that um, the more television a person watches, the more likely they are to adopt the beliefs about reality from the content that they're seeing on TV. Okay. okay. So it stands to reason then if we are watching television and television content is full of violence, for example, then heavy viewers of television are going to be more likely to adopt the belief that the world is a very violent place. Okay. So in a nutshell, that's what cultivation theory is about. Okay, so that concept of cultivation, uh, how is that difference from like transmission? Because I'm kind of wonder about like if I watch a show and then I think something like what's the sure. difference around the, the cultivation idea? Well, that's a great question. And it's not like if I binge watch Game of Thrones for a week, suddenly I'm going to either act very violent or feel like the world is a scary violent place. But cultivation means that this is a very gradual, slow, okay. yet pervasive process. Okay. So this will happen over a number of years, and it will happen based on the amount of television content we consume. 
So over time, gradually, we will cultivate a belief about the way that the world is. Okay. So the cultivation then is that this notion doesn't just get a transmitted uh, element into like my thinking and belief pattern and behavior, but right. that it grows out of exactly. that exposure. That's okay. exactly right, over time. Okay, mm -hmm. and then the main tenets of the theory, so we have cultivation, what are the other, we talk about the mean scary world um, right. and a couple other um, ideas. So basically the entire cultural environment project um, had three prongs, and the first one was the institutional process analysis. And here is a part of Gerbner's research where he wanted to really get behind the media itself as an entity and to look at what drives the media to produce the content that they produce. And of course, we know that there is a bottom line mentality that exists in the media mm -hmm. and it is a for-profit institution so that we absolutely or they have a concern for making money. Okay. So the first thing that he looks at then is um, because we know the media wants to make money, what kind of content are they going to produce that will ensure that they do make money? Okay. Okay. So that's the first thing that we're looking at. And the way that he addresses that is by saying um, or arguing towards there being a lot of violent content is by saying that the media is likely to create content that is violent because it's easy to transmit to other countries. Okay. So from a global perspective, it's cheaper and easier. You don't have to translate violence. Everybody knows what violence is and what a car explosion looks like or um, what murder looks like, mm -hmm. etc. So um, it's easy to then sell that to foreign countries. So that's kind of the institutional process. So that's part. where violence gets like a prominent Correct. place because of that portability. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly okay. right. So then the second part or prong is the message system analysis. And this is where he really gets into the um, quantitative content analysis portion of it, where he wants to discover exactly what are we seeing on TV? What is the content mm -hmm. that is prevalent there? Um, and when are we watching it? And et cetera, et cetera. The last part is the cultivation analysis. And that is the part that is now really looking at whether or not his hypothesis is correct. And that is where he says that people who are heavy viewers of television content are more likely to perceive that the world is going to be a very mean and scary place because of the amount of violence that they've seen. Because the violence is the main content. Because the violence is the main content. And then the consumption of that plants the seed that cultivates the belief and that's it, viewpoint. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. So then um, you talked about kind of some measurement ideas. And so one of the questions to ask you is um, when we think about the measurement, like how did they do some of these measurements? What kind of measurements would you tell us about? Okay. Well, for, uh, to begin with, the quantitative content analysis portion of it, um, he had to conceptualize a definition of what violence is to begin mm -hmm. with in order to be able to train coders so that they could go in and watch television content and determine what was violent and what was not. Right. So do you want me to give you a definition? Sure, okay. sure. Okay, so he defined violence as, and I quote, the overt expression of physical force with or without a weapon against self or others compelling action against one's will on pain of being hurt, killed, or threatened as part of the plot. So okay. there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, um, very much so. A few of the things about that definition is it does not include verbal abuse. Okay, so idle threats and maybe mm -hmm. yelling and aggressive behavior mm -hmm. is not included. It also does not include uh, physical violence. I mean, it does include, excuse me, vis physical violence found in cartoons. Okay. Okay, so he decided to also include Saturday morning children's programming from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. in his analysis. Okay. Um, and then finally, it does also count auto crashes and natural disasters because his point was someone's being hurt or killed regardless mm -hmm. of how they're being hurt mm -hmm. or killed. Mm -hmm. So it still cultivates that fear that we have about as soon as I step outside of the house, right. something could happen to me, something horrible could happen to me. So they conceptualize the, the violence this way and then they operationalize it to special coding uh, elements or features where coders go on to watch this programming and 
figure out uh, the incidences, I guess, is what we would say, right? That's right. And so they were doing, my understanding is they were doing that between 7 and 11 on primetime blocks, right? Yes. And they were doing it over the 40 years, kind of every primetime season, and then also included that Saturday yes. capture. Yes. Okay. For the first 20 years when Gerbner was heading up this research himself, he would take one full week every fall season. And every network show between some, some estimates say 7 to 11, some say 8 to 11, primetime TV, PM, um, would videotape every single network program that was on. And then he would, like you said, train coders with his definition of what violence is mm -hmm. and ask them to mark down every time they saw a violent incident take place. Okay. Okay, so that's basically the notion that we could try to quantify the incidences of violence and then get sort of a, I don't know, a measurement around this uh, notion, are, are violent acts really occurring in the media and to what extent? So we could see right. the measurement over the 40 years, which is pretty interesting exactly. as a metric to yes. say we have this much compared to last year, compared to the next year it's and incredible. all that. It's yeah. incredible. Um, one comment that I would make, honestly, about the, the coders is that sometimes when we talk about coding, uh, a lot of people will make criticisms of the coding and say, gosh, it's not very reliable, something we're talking about actually in this episode. And one of the comments that I would make is that it's actually very difficult to achieve what we call inner rater reliability. So these coders inside this project or inside this program of research have to achieve very high levels of agreement in the violence that they're seeing. And then we subtract mathematically chance from that. So the number that you might see, which is already a great number of agreement, is actually reflective of even a higher first level of agreement. In other words, we may get like a 90% agreement on our coding or 95 and then lower it slightly due to chance. But the comment that I would make as any of us consume any kind of data on intercoder reliability would be to observe that it is very, actually very hard to achieve. And so I consider it a strength of the Gerbner research to say this heavy training that they oh, were going through and, yes. and repeating it over yes, and over absolutely. is pretty defensible. Like yes, it, it really, well, yes, that is what it allows it to be such a significant finding right. at the end of the day is because they were pretty rigorous in the way that they yeah. developed this methodology. Right. So, yes. So we talked about um, this idea of viewership, so the heavy and the light viewer. Oh, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's part of the theory. And my question is, are there, what are the standards for that? When okay. we operationalize that concept, like what um, are the hours and then what mm -hmm. happens if I don't maybe make those hours exactly? Yeah, yeah. that's a Im really important question because the way that he distinguishes heavy viewers from light viewers is through hours watched. So for a heavy viewer, he would say that anyone who watches four or more hours of TV a day is considered to be a television type or a heavy viewer. Okay. Anyone who watches less than two hours of television a day would be considered a light viewer. Okay. And so what he was interested in was getting the comparison between the heavy viewers and the light viewers and whether or not you know, their ideas about the world were being cultivated through TV. Okay, so then what I hear you saying is this notion that essentially viewership would act as like an independent variable. We'd have the heavy viewer group, yes. we've had the light viewer group, and we're looking at the perception of violence exactly. between those two groups, like the comparison. That's right. Okay, and so that's where we get what we saw in the video, which is, hey, these numbers don't match up. Right, exactly. With what, the with actual, what is actually happening actually occurring. in society, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay, but even though we're still seeing the high incidence of violence on television, it doesn't match the high or low incidence in society, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. No, as the video mentioned, we, over the past 30 years, have consistently seen crime rates, violent crime rates, actually go down, while the perception to the public, especially for a heavy viewer, mm -hmm. is that violent crime is going up. Right. And there has to be a reason for that. And this is the argument that the reason is because of the amount of TV that they're watching. Right. And one of the things to observe, too, is that this research, while you saw it kind of cut off in that study at 2010 um, on, the, on the video, and then you heard my cite, source citation of 2014, uh, those are matching the domination of television as a media format, yes. mm -hmm. whereas we will talk in a minute about some of the changing elements in our world. But part of why we give you those older stats is to match it with the, all the project 
and program research going on in Gerbner's paradigm. Exactly, that's correct. Right, okay. Um, but we actually are seeing that even though, I mean, I, I, the direction you're going is talking about the changes in media. And like, oh, yeah. Um, but still, television is the primary mm -hmm. media platform that most Americans will participate in. Okay. It remains in 2017 to still be television. Wow. Yes. So over 60 percent. Okay. So uh, something I just am thinking about now. What about movies in all of this? Like, yes. is that part of this program of research? I think yeah. When Gerbner does this original study, he does reference movies quite okay. a bit, especially because they have that important um, ability to be transported globally. Yeah. Because movies are a very huge industry, especially Western movies. So yes, movies are included in the, in. As, as part of it, yes. Okay, because I would think that that would be, when we talk mm -hmm. about portability, it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, measuring violence. Yeah. Um, so he's measuring viewership that one way. Um, yes. What about the perception of violence? Like, thoughts on the measurement there? Uh, which part are you talking about? Well, I, you know, there's a couple of different things. I guess I'll comment and then maybe ask you a question. Sure. Um, I know that they at one point did, and they're, Okay, there's over 500 studies in this area, so it's obviously we can't refer to any one. We can talk about some similarities between all of the different research articles. But um, one um, early aspect they were doing in the 70s was looking at the rate of victimization. In other words, oh, they yeah. would give people, so for example, methodologically, they would give individuals 40 pictures, and they would say put them into two stacks, the group of those who do the murdering and the group of people who are likely to be murdered. And so one of the things that we learned um, from that methodology was they found very consistent patterns, which is pretty interesting. Consistent patterns of those who are doing the murdering are young males, mm -hmm. and those who are being oh, yeah. killed, females and older males. And that was a pretty strong result that was repeated many times. So that's a, that process of replication. Um, this idea that the perception of being uh, a victim of, of crime is reflected in that. So. Um, what are your thoughts related to like media in terms of, of that? Yes, I think that that is a, an extremely important finding in that um, one of the things that Gerbner discovered through his cultivation analysis, the last part of it, was that um, certain groups are going to be grossly underrepresented. Okay. And you talked about women as being one of these groups and their feelings of being victimized or mm -hmm. whether or not they were going to be victimized. And what interestingly he found through this research is that minorities are vastly underrepresented and when they actually are represented in television, they're often seen as being the victim okay. or the perpetrator of the violence. So basically there's a kind of symbolic double jeopardy going on yeah. here where yeah. we're not as a society learning or understanding anything about minority groups or about women mm. as a minority group except for what we're seeing on television and if television is showing these groups as being perpetrators or victims of violence then we begin to think Ooh, that yeah. actually wow yeah that they really don't have much of an experience in society and so are we it's sort of filling in the blanks of what we don't know about like a minority group, so to speak? Yes. And then the media is our educator. Egg, that's, a, oh, that's a perfect way to put it because you have to try to imagine we're in an area that's fairly diverse, of course. Um, but for many people in this country, they are mm -hmm. not. And so right. if they're heavy viewers and their only exposure to minority groups is through what they see on television, imagine right. the images that they conjure of these groups and why they hmm. think the way that they think. Okay. So yes, it's absolutely an educator. So as we look at worldview, um, we can see how they conceptualized it and then operationalized it. And so I guess I understand the connection of worldview and then this idea of it being related or unrelated to our beliefs. But it sort of begs a, maybe an earlier question, which is, do we watch something on TV and do it? Like, is there that kind of a modeling, so to speak, kind of idea? And of course, and that's a great question. And yes, I mean, for a long time, there was early mass media research that felt like we have something to fear when our children watch television because if they see violent content on TV, then they're going to be more likely to actually enact that violent behavior, which in fact has been disproven since then and mm -hmm. really goes kind of against what Cultivation mm -hmm. was saying because the belief that the, mean, that the world is a mean and scary place supersedes us actually behaving in a violent way. 
So social modeling said that we, we, we could watch what we saw and then actually behave that way. Mm -hmm. Now, further down the line, as more research was done, what they found was that it is true there is a connection between seeing violence on television and feeling aggressive okay. later. Okay. okay. So there is a definite correlation mm -hmm. there, but it's not so much that we're going to go out and enact a violent behavior as a result of watching right. TV. Right. So that's kind of interesting related to the crime statistics, because that kind of proves it as well, to yes. say, if we really thought that, then we would have seen an uh, uptick. You know, if our exactly. programming has that, we yes. would have seen an uptick st statistically and not a downturn that over is an time, right? That's an excellent point, yes. So, and some of what happens there, just to talk about the methods side again, um, we do analyses like that using what's called meta-analysis often, mm -hmm. which is where we take not just one study, but we take all of the data and findings in multiple studies and add them together to make much larger um, conclusions, which is really necessary in this kind of a theory. Yes, right? it is. It's, and there, there have been a, several giant. of them done. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's very important. All right, so let's talk about flaws. Uh, we have to talk okay. about flaws in measurement. We know every measurement is flawed, probably, involving humans. Um, what are some flaws you see in this program? Well, there are several, and you know, several that have been cited by other researchers as well. Um, one of the things was about the content itself and the idea that why did Gerbner decide to lump all genres of primetime TV content together when there are obvious differences between like mm -hmm. a sitcom, for example, and a drama, right. which are both shown during primetime TV. So some mm -hmm. researchers felt like, well, those should be separate things. Um, also, there was some criticism about non-random methods of selecting respondents. Okay. There was also some criticism about the self-report data of having people tell us whether or not they were a heavy viewer, a light viewer, a moderate viewer. Right, right. Um, above all that, I think probably mm -hmm. the biggest thing was an, some people believe there was an over-reliance on his causal explanation that heavy viewing okay. causes mean world syndrome. Right, because if they're doing correlation data, then obviously they can't make that causal connection. Exactly. Of course, they can try to do it in multiple regression models, uh, assign causality, same with um, structural equation modeling. So these are later studies in the system and obviously are going to use better metrics. Um, one thing we talked about you know, earlier in the show is this idea of levels of measurement. And of course, you can see um, some categories, categorical variables and also continuous variables appear here. And one of the, the, the items that occurs to me as you're talking about the classification of viewership mm -hmm. is we got better at figuring that out on a continuous measure than Absolutely. classifying it as just categorical, height, you know, heavy versus light. Right. But to be fair, when you're doing difference testing, you have to have groups, right? So you take the ends and you yeah. compare the ends, mm -hmm. which does make sense. It does. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing to think from a method standpoint. Um, okay, so this is a TV viewership uh, theory mm -hmm. or, or paradigm, however big you want to classify it. Yes. Um, so my question is, do you believe this operates the same way in social media now? Like, where are we today? Because I, like you said, that still we see television as the main storyteller. We do. I mean, that's true from your specialty. My question is, gosh, it seems like there's a lot of other screens out there than our oh, television. And so. there sure are. And recent research through um, the Kaiser Family Foundation has found that we spend 70% of our waking hours in front of some type of a screen. Oh, wow. So if it's not television, it's the internet, or it's our mobile phone, or it's a video game, or it's some yeah. other type of media platform. Um, so it's critically important to continue the examination of cultivation analysis mm -hmm. and to see wh what is changing now mm -hmm. that media consumption is changing. Right. Um, so the question, do I believe that it would operate the same way in social media is a very tricky one. <laughs> That's and where I'm going. <laughs> it's very tricky and I would answer yes and mm. no. Okay. Um, if we believe that what we see on the internet at large it is um, storytelling, it, if it is narrative about what's going on in mm -hmm. our culture, then yes, I think that it could ultimately, for people who consume a vast amounts of the internet, mm -hmm. could definitely have a cultivation effect take place. But we, social media in particular, um, is more interpersonal than mass media. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it that way, I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure yet. 
But research is being done currently yeah. on social media and the internet and on content of the internet, which is critically important. Um, but television is still still the, the number one most important thing because no matter how they're accessing television, mm -hmm. because it can be through the internet, it can right. be through your mobile phone, it can be, we're still watching television. So Right. I'm just thinking about the enormous task of coding content on the internet. I I, I'm not, not even, even sure imagine. how you, of course you I can randomly imagine. select content mm -hmm. and format and, yes. and you know, Topical amount of use and, and yeah, yeah, all these things. But I'm right. wondering how you even begin that kind of task. It seems pretty yes. crazy to yes. try to I capture. I think it's going to take very slow <laughs> steps. And yeah a really extensive research program to actually topically look at different genres that are being presented on the internet and then to try to analyze it that right. way. So it seems like sort of a gift when you have Gerbner's research, it actually is helpful that we don't have social media at that same time right. operating as a prominent factor yes. because all of a sudden we lose all these other variables exactly. that you're saying are now added into this equation, That's which right. is what makes it complicated. Yes. Uh, I guess the thing I'm, and you can comment on this, uh, but I, I sort of wonder about the, I understand the mean and scary world, and I understand that that's still a notion that a lot of people have, you know, about mm, violence. Absolutely. I'm certainly our world of terrorism hasn't helped either, that's right? Because right. we see that, you know, which we probably could do just studies on that. But um, one of the questions that I wonder about is when we think about these kind of theory and research applications in social media, will we find that it's not a mean and scary world, it's a mean and isolated world? Because it seems like a lot of these ideas are more about me or mm -hmm. my own self in participation in social Absolutely. media versus like the collective thinking. Yeah. I don't know. Thoughts I on that? I think that's very interesting. And as producers now of mass media, if you will, not just consumers, mm -hmm. we do have a significant responsibility. And I think at the end of the day, interpersonally, what we're all really after is connection and attachment mm -hmm. and feeling as part of a community. Right. And I think with social media, that is so much of what people are striving to achieve is approval and community and attachment. <laughs> Yet, like you say, it's having it. an opposite yeah. effect where we're feeling even more isolated mm -hmm. than we were prior to yeah. our use of social media. Hmm. So. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens with yeah. this media. Very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thank insights you. on cultivation and, and all of the other theories related to it. Um, we appreciate your help, and um, thank you for coming on the show. Why, thank you for having me. So now let's go back and review some of the terms that we started with on the show. We talked about the notion of conceptualization and operationalization, reliability and validity, and also measurement levels. So as we're thinking about that, let's go back through the Gerbner research we just talked about and think through the connections that we can make. First, we think about the idea of conceptualization. Let's take the ideas of violence or the mean scary world or um, perceptions of violence. We can take any of those concepts and then think about how Gerbner chose to operationalize them. Um, for example, when he talked about viewership, he had people self-report how much viewership they tend to um, engage in. And so they would be classified after reporting that into the light, moderate, and heavy viewers. And so as we think about that, um, the idea of self-reporting that may or may not be a stable and consistent measurement in terms of reliability. So that would be something we'd have to think about. Um, we'd also have to make a decision of, ask, of the idea of asking individuals their perception of violence. Um, is the, the survey used? when he used survey methodology, is it reliable? Now, the very good news about that is that we do have reliability tests on survey instruments. So we have the ability to look at the answers that people give on surveys, like in Gerbner's study, and run what we call reliability tests. And that means that we can look to see if the individual is answering consistently and if the instrument is responsible for helping with that consistency. Um, and I can show you the math about that later on, but that's basically the idea behind it. Of course, we'd have to talk about the idea of validity. This idea that we have to think about when Gerbner was asking these different questions, and of course there's 500 studies, but when he was asking these questions, was he actually valid in his measurement of the concepts that he was thinking about? 
And that's a pretty interesting concept that we could debate as well. This idea that are you actually measuring violence? Um, he clarifies it as perceptions of violence. And I think that's probably valid to say that how we, if we ask you how you perceive it um, and collect it in a reliable way, then we also would increase the validity in that we're trying to capture what we think we're trying to capture. So we think about all of that. Um, and think about those ideas as being very important when we think about how those decisions play out in terms of research. Now, the last thing to talk about is the measurement levels. And so as we think about that, we want to think about the four different measurement levels that we talked about in the video. We talked about nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data measurement. And as we're thinking about those, you can see those pop up in Gerbner's research. This idea that when individuals are classified as light, moderate, and heavy viewers, if we think about that variable and how we're collecting those data, um, we would identify that as an ordinal variable. In that, we have uh, ascending categories where order does matter. So you can think about connecting different research you've seen back to those original concepts, and ordinal measurement would be one of those. Um, the other idea that we might talk about is this idea of continuous measurement. So Gerbner was um, associating different perceptions in his survey data and using what we call composite variables, meaning that multiple questions would be added together mathematically to create perceptual um, variables of various um, violence and crime and different things. And then you heard in the research that that was then correlated with crime rate. And so as you think about that, we think of those as continuous data measurements, right? The, because there's an absolute zero, we could have zero crime. And when we think about their association, we would correlate them in and try to detect the changes in the variance of the responses. Um, you will hear me say often that uh, continuous data is superior to categorical data. And the reason is because of that very thing, and that is our desire to capture the variance. So as we think about today's show, we want to also make one more note about the null hypothesis. And that's this idea that when we think about Gerbner's research, remember what the null hypothesis is. And I know you've been reading about that idea. The null hypothesis is that there is no difference between the, li the light, moderate, and heavy viewer. Um, the null is that there isn't something going on. And so when you think about Gerbner's research, you can even apply that concept and the notion that the null hypothesis is that there are no differences. And so you can, you can kind of apply that back to the hypotheses we've talked about in previous shows and the boldness that Gerbner ultimately had as he was trying to make this prediction that um, our mean, scary world perception was uh, created by America's storyteller, the television. So to wrap up today's show, we want to talk about a few different ideas that we covered. First, we covered key measurement areas. We went through the idea of different terms. Then we talked about how we measure media, perceptions, and violence. And then we analyzed um, these same ideas through uh, talking about how those, uh, those can be applied back to Gerbner's research. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the show, and I hope that it has piqued your interest in cultivation theory. Um, I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, hoping your day is not just different, but significantly different. Mm -hmm.